so sorry about the quality of the audio in the last video. There are about six minutes of the most obnoxious sound you've ever heard where my zipper kept hitting the mic on the phone. And uh, I didn't really realize it until after I uploaded it, but um, some people pressed through, some people bailed, which I, I would probably bail. I, after about six minutes of zipper noise, I'm thinking, I hate you, I hate your channel, I'm unsubscribing. <laughs> uh, but sorry. So I, I'll probably maybe have to redo that message or something. I don't know. It, see, the thing is, is these are hard to redo because it's total inspiration. I have no idea what I'm going to say. And the ideas come in real time, you know. So uh, it's hard to go back and, you know, hit it, so to speak. Um, I'm driving for a couple hours to go pick up a painting that somebody, my, the Brittany Mason painting of Hebrews, someone owns a frame shop and printed it for me and framed it. I'm really excited. So I'm going to go pick that up. And uh, so I'm in the car for a bit. And I thought I'd continue. Um, now we're talking in First John about absolutes, mostly absolutes. What is it that believers have versus what of those antichrists do not have? And uh, the point of yesterday's message is that when he's talking about hating his brother and walking in darkness, he is not talking about believers. He's ta he's getting ready to talk about these antichrists. And I made the point that, look, he's not even talking about, look, this is something you grow in. He's saying this is true. If you don't have it, you don't have, uh, you're not saved. So that's why First John is so difficult. Because if we define love the way Paul defines it in 1 Corinthians 13, where you're supposed to seek to grow in it, then... That's, that just overturns everything. No, what he's talking about here is he is warning them against these antichrists that are seducing them. And the problem with these antichrists is that they believe in God, but do not believe that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. And they say things like they have fellowship with God, but they say they sin not. And they say they walk in the light. And they say they, uh, they have a lot of boasts, you know. And meanwhile, they're seducing the saints uh, and causing them to stumble. So, um, through false doctrine, legalistic doctrines, antichrist doctrines, the spirit of error is how he addresses it. And I said that, you know, he's talking about absolutes, and um, here he says in verse 10, He that loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no occasion of stumbling in him. Uh, but he that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and knows not where he goes because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Uh, but then he follows it up and says, look, I write this to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write you, fathers, because you have known him from the beginning. I write you, young men, because you've overcome the wicked ones. I write to you, children, because you've known the father. I've written to you fathers because you've known him that is from the beginning. I've written unto you young men because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Now he needed to say all that because he, I think the Holy Spirit anticipates the problem we have when we read something so absolute that if you don't love your brother, you're walking in darkness, you know, and the light is, and, and you're blind. Um, well, he follows that up by saying, look, you know God. You do abide in him. His word does abide in you. You are in the light. You're not one of these people that says they know God but doesn't. You're not the one that I'm talking about, in other words. And I said that even this isn't a matter of growth. See, First John is not a book about how to grow in how to love people. It really isn't. It's talking about a basic thing that's present, the new commandment that is true in Christ and in you because the darkness is past and the true light shines. We are in the light and that light is shining and the darkness is past. And that corresponds with Colossians that says we've been transferred out of the authority of darkness and into the kingdom of the son of his love. 
And Peter says, we've been called out of darkness uh, and into his marvelous light. Um, we're no longer in the darkness. The darkness is past. The darkness is of the world. The darkness is of those people who are walking in the way of Cain, who reject Christ as their propitiation for the sins of their brothers and therefore hate their brothers. When he's talking about hating your brother here, he's talking about something really terminal, the sin unto death, the way of Cain. Again, it's all defined in in uh, 1 John 3, especially verse 12, that tells us, let us love one another, not as Cain. And it turns out that we can't believe the gospel, believe that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins and the sins of the whole world, and hate our brother the way Cain did. Because that came, that hatred specifically has to do with rejecting the gospel, rejecting the propitiation, and seeking to be justified by works, uh, and requiring it of others, you know. And I said it's not a matter of growth because every person in this group that he addresses, the fathers, the young men, and the children, regardless of their stage of growth, this is true of them, this new commandment. They know God. They've overcome the wicked one. Um, the young ones know him who's from the beginning, and so do the fathers. And this knowledge of God is what puts them in the light. So they're not walking in darkness regardless of their feelings towards someone. This is not talking about your feelings towards someone or something that you develop. Now somebody asked me, well, how does that differ from 1 Corinthians 13? Because clearly he's admonishing us to seek love as the more excellent way. And then he describes it. And clearly that's the love of God. And John does talk about his, being perfected in his love and having his love cast out all fear and dwelling in his love. And, and, but it, knowing that it is not our love for him, but his love for us. And that's the same thing as Paul is talking about when he talks about the love of God being shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. On the one hand, we are, the new commandment is true in us. Okay, we can't hate the way Cain does. But on the other hand, as we walk in the light and in the fellowship, uh, we have fellowship with one another and the love does grow stronger. Our sense of God's love grows stronger. Our knowledge of his love grows stronger. Our abiding in his love grows richer are dwelling in his love. John talks about dwelling in God's love. Not producing your own love, but dwelling in God's love. So I don't see a conflict. Um, Paul is actually really referring to, yeah, we need to grow in our knowledge of God's love. And John does pretty much say the same thing about God assuring our heart before him and casting out all the fear. That's something we grow in. But it's all based on what we have. And that's what Paul teaches too. We call it positional truth. That everything we grow in in Christ is just an outworking of what Christ has already put in us by the Spirit. It's not like we're adding new things that aren't there. We are having what's in there flow out. And this is talking about the difference between the believers who do have this love and the Cain, people who take the way of Cain who don't period. They just don't. So they can't, even if they pretend to love, because they pretend to love God, they hate their brother and they, and they can't not hate him. They just, it just, the darkness in them rises up. Just like with Cain, you know, God told him, look, this sin is going to master you. And then that hatred in him rose up and he killed uh, Abel. And that was just a manifestation of what he was. And when the light comes... Everything is manifested. So that's one of the reasons why when you have the gospel and you're focused on Christ and you're walking in that light and speaking that light, the hatred comes out much stronger because the light actually makes it manifest. When Jesus went into Jerusalem, the Pharisees all thought that they loved God and they had a reputation for being very loving and, and genteel and kind. They didn't think they were murderers, but sooner or later they were crying, we have no king but Caesar, give us Barabbas and crucify Jesus, you know? 
their hatred overtook them. And that's what Jesus came for, was to manifest the truth. Not only by speaking it, but by his very being, the light. Everything in everybody's hearts around him was manifested. Everybody was manifested for what they are. It's pretty amazing. So we do encounter that. Uh, okay, I'm going to edit these together. I'm going to take little breaks. This brings us then, this brings us to the next stumbling block, which is the world. And when we, when I say stumbling block, I mean, I'm treating John as in, you know, am I teaching it kind of, but I'm really just trying to say, these are the things I've struggled with reading John that have caused me to stay away from this book. And here's now the comforts that the Holy Spirit has given me that have allowed me now to enter, to, to enjoy this book. And I, I'm finding that as I share these things, everybody's like, yep, that's the problem. I, I mean, there's a, yeah, everybody's got the same thing. It produces the same response. Um, and, you know, this this letter was written to a church that had a, a mixture of people who were saved and unsaved. Obviously, the Antichrists, you know, that were among them. And he's addressing the ones who have an ear to hear and can hear it and believe. But he's also aware that everybody's going to see this letter. Everybody's going to read it. So he has, he's speaking in such absolute terms because there are those that actually need to be saved. <laughs> you know, if, and, and, uh, but he tells us how we can know we're saved in this book. He tells us how we can know we have eternal life, right? And it has to do with believing the testimony, not working, not doing the works of the law, or even loving, the way we know we have eternal life is because we believe the record. And he says it all so absolutely that it becomes clear that believing the record is also the same thing as loving your brethren. It's very, it's very cool. Uh, because when we're talking about loving your brethren, he's not talking about feelings, he's talking about the way God loves, the way God reckons things. Walking in the light means, yeah, I know you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. And if we dwell on the sin, that's not going to be good. You know, I'm gonna, we're going to get on each other's nerves. It's part of the sin. But I also recognize that you have the same access to God that I do because of your faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, who is the propitiation. And we, and I talked about in the message that the way we forgive and the way we love, ultimately, is to extend the love of God to someone by faith. We acknowledge that a believer in Christ has the same privilege I do, because for the same reasons. Not because of any merit in themselves, not because I like them, but because of the blood. And, you know, I talked about, and I'm covering some of this again because the audio was so bad, but I talked about how when we are commanded to forgive in the New Testament, after the resurrection of Christ, it's for Christ's sake. Just as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us, we are to forgive others because we've been forgiven for Christ's sake. And it's ba it's a covenant forgiveness. It's based on the everlasting covenant that God made with the Son, who became the shepherd of the sheep and gave his life for them. And it's based on the fact that he paid the price for their sins. And that is a reckoning of faith, not a feeling. Feelings do follow if we enjoy fellowship together based on the propitiation. Okay? You can have real problems with a brother, but then start, take Lord's table with him where you are really focused on the benefits of the blood of Jesus Christ and his redemptive work, and you're praising God together in it. It washes you. Uh, and then there's a fellowship. The, the, the sin is cleansed. He, Jesus washes our feet. But it's all based on faith in the blood, which is what Cain does not have, and that's why he can't love. Uh, okay. So now this next stumbling block, he says he's talking about these 
he's getting ready to talk about these antichrists, these people that walk in darkness. Now that darkness is the world. It's on the one hand an ignorance of the truth, but out of that ignorance the world system was formed. You know, Cain left the presence of God and had to fend for himself. And so in, in his record of him and his descendants, we see them building cities, developing agricultural methods, develop weapons and armor and methods of war to protect themselves, and developing um, ways to entertain themselves, musical instruments. It all came out of Cain's line. That's the world system. What is that? That is an orphan that doesn't have a father having to fend for himself. And the world system was developed out of that. But those things in themselves are not bad because uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Abraham had a household of trained servants that knew how to fight. And they knew how to sow and reap and, do, and, and plant and harvest. And, uh, you know, David was a musician. So the things of the world, the things that come out of the world system that were developed first in Cain's line are not necessarily bad in themselves. So the world has to be speaking of something more intrinsic. Again, there's something deeper here. And uh, we read this next verse that says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For any, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then, uh, oh, I'm not saved. <laughs> it's like one thing after another, you know. I watch TV. I'm a musician. I like doing things. Uh, the love of the Father doesn't dwell in me? Is that what he's talking about? And um, I remember going to a Reformed church where most of the elders and their families were, they, were, they, they had lots of kids and they homeschooled them. And I was a musician. And that, they, they just assumed was worldly. So I had stopped doing IT work and I had started my wedding business and it was doing pretty well. And uh, um, it was taking care of all of my, taking care of our needs and everything. But, you know, my weekends were busy. I work on the weekends, which means sometimes I miss uh, this and that, you know, or I'm not always around because I've got a wedding, I've got a wedding, and they're thinking he's playing music. And in their mind, I'm in the bar band. That's just the way they saw it, you know. They couldn't see that I was up there playing classical music with a cellist or even jazz at the cocktail hour and that this was a highly trained art form or anything like that. This that To them, it's like, I might as well have just been getting drunk and, you know, having a party. That's the way they looked at it. The, because they looked at it as worldly. We were worldly. Our kids go to public school. My wife teaches in public school. She teaches at the school where my kid goes. And she, it's a very good, it's one of the best school districts in the country. Um, but to them, that was just like, you love the world, you know. And they had their homeschooling. And their kids didn't watch TV. And their kids did memorize the Calvinist catechism. And their kids were super well behaved at church. Uh, you know, and it's all very commendable. I, I mean, actually, I, I was impressed. I was like, wow, you know, and they did it uh, well. They ruled their houses well, I'll give them that. However, they didn't see that that was their world. And they loved their world more than I loved mine. I mean, yes, I do the weddings and I do my cocktail hours and stuff, but it's not like I'm up playing with Mariah Carey or something. I mean, I've said this before, that my highest paying gigs are over by the purses at Saks Fifth Avenue, you know, at Christmas. $500 gig, but it's one of the most embarrassing times of the year. You're over there by the purses playing the piano, you know. <laughs> There's not, there's not a lot of earthly glory with the kind of situations I'm in. 
but I'm doing what I enjoy and I'm sharing music and you know I've been humbled enough that I don't really care about the fact that I'm not known as the best musician the best this and that and I'm playing with famous people and all that stuff that ship has sailed and I said no to that you know um, but to them I was worldly and yet their homeschooling their culture of what they considered sanctification was their world and you know now I know that most of these people weren't saved they didn't believe the gospel and they judged us you know this is what John is talking about there is something where your identity is built up in being an orphan and providing for yourself and doing it all see Cain had to develop all that stuff because he'd been cast out of God's presence and yes, the, the things he developed benefited everybody. I, I you know, again. Uh, but, you know, he built cities. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't dwell in cities. They dwelt in tents, you know. Cities are a precursor to Babel. Now, cities are banning people together in a, in a single identity. That has something to do more with the world. You know, let us build a tower so that our we won't be scattered, so that we can have a name, you know. Uh, Babel came out of that. Um, that's more... Okay, now you're talking about the spirit of the world. The spirit of the world organizes people together and starts building things in opposition to God to make a name for themselves. And you get an identity in the system. And that's what what these people were doing in this Reformed Church. The Reformed Church was their world. Calvinism was their world. That was their city. Their homeschooling and all the quirks that go with it and the culture that went with it was their world. And we were judged because we did not have a place in their world. And yet it wasn't Christ. Christ calls us out of the world unto himself and he is our ground for associating with each other. Not our culture. Culture is something of the world. And their homeschooling thing was their culture. And it became ordinances by which they judged who was in and out, who was out. So when you, are me when you are in the world, you start measuring yourself and others and saying they're in, they're out, he has status, he has no status, based on how well you do in this system of orphans that doesn't have God as the provider. It's really interesting. <laughs> uh... It's a system made out of unbelief and lacking the presence of God. And then you build your identity in it. And now you're talking about loving the world. Okay. Um, and when you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. And he does talk about the things of the world. But again, now, when you talk about the world from the point of view of John and Paul. Paul says, I am crucified through the world and the world to me. The, uh, they are talking about an aspect of the world called religion. When Jesus said, the world hates me because I expose its works as evil, he was talking about the Pharisees. In John 15, he talks about marveling not that the world hates you, they're going to persecute you and cast you out of the synagogues because of my name. And uh, actually, we should look at that real quick. I was reading that this morning. Praise the Lord. Uh, he says, uh, these things I command you that you love one another. Now, this is the same thing. This is John, okay? John's epistle is an explanation of his doctrine that shows up in his gospel. But anyway, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word I said, the servant is not greater than the Lord. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they keep my saying, they'll keep yours also. But all these things they do to you for my name's sake, because they've not known him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, who? The world. Did he go to Caesar? No. Did he go to the Praetorian Guard? No. Paul did later. Where did he go? Jerusalem. 
They had no sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He came and uncovered the sin of the Pharisees that had been hidden in the veneer of their religion, which was their world. He that hates me hates the Father also. If I had not done among them the works which no other man did, they had no sin, but now they've seen and hated me and the Father. But this comes to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. So he is talking about the world, right? But who's he talking about? He's specifically speaking about the religious world. And when Paul says, I am crucified the world and the world to me, what's he talking about? Well, that's in Galatians, and he's talking about the Judaizers. He says, I bear the marks of Jesus Christ. And he was talking about the pressure in Jerusalem by those who, who were perceived to be pillars who exercised so much influence that even the great apostle Peter shrank back from eating the, from the, uh, with the Gentiles for fear of the Jews that were sent from James. Wow. The pressure in the world. You know, throughout John, there is this theme, the gospel, uh, that there were Pharisees that believed in Jesus but were afraid to be put out of the synagogue and so would not publicly confess him. And it says they love the glory of men rather than the glory that comes from God. And then that guy in John 5, I believe, was healed of his blindness. Was that John 5? No, that was uh, John 8, I think. John 8. He's healed of his blindness. And he, he's discovered, he goes in the temple, you know, and his parents are there and his parents basically disown him. They, they would not really sneak up for him because they were afraid of being kicked out of the synagogue. See, it's when, when, the rule, when you love the things of the world, it really messes with your loyalty to God. And the strongest, most intoxicating element of the world is religious. Babel was a religious system in opposition to God that involved worship of Tammuz, the son of Nimrod, who is ultimately Baal. It's Baal worship, who is an antichrist, false Christ. World and antichrist goes together. The world builds up to something religious. The beast is religious. So when John especially and Paul talk about the world, many, most times you'll find that they're actually talking about religion. So that, that should flip some things in your head a little bit. Um, again, we're talking about how do we get free from these stumbling blocks? Do you love the world? Well, I like watching TV. Paul said God gave us all things to enjoy. You know? Now, there are things we shouldn't watch on TV. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying, though, is, you know, last night, my, my wife and I like this show, Married at First Sight. And it's beautiful when it works. You know, it's these people that get married. They, they're matched by experts, and then they get married without having seen each other. And it's like an arranged marriage. And then you follow their life and see how they do, you know. Some do well, some don't. But uh, does that mean I love the world? Well, he says the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Uh, let me get back. He defines the world. Love not the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes away. I wasn't sitting there lusting in my heart while I was watching Married at First Sight. Nor did it do anything for my pride, my pride of life, making me think I'm something. Um, nor was I you know, attracted, to, I mean, you know, it, there was nothing in my flesh that was sinning, watching TV, just vegging out, we need, you know, see, that's the thing, is that we think of everything in terms of carnal ordinances, do not touch, do not handle, do not taste, which Paul said are of no value against the real indulgence of the flesh, the indulgence of the flesh is really about your identity in the world, trying to be something. Now he is saying 
I can see here where he's saying, look, don't love the world, and he's saying it to believers too. Because the world is very intoxicating and seductive, and through it you can be manipulated. You know, Christians suffer in religion for a longer time than they need to in the institutional churches. And that it clouds their ability to really stand firmly in their justification by faith and not being manipulated by men and not being taken off as spoil and not being succumbing to false teachers. Why? Because their love for the world clouds their view. That's actually a possibility for believers. And he's saying, look, the love of the Father is not dwelling in you. Does that mean you're not saved? Ultimately, he's talking about the Antichrists, okay? Which he's going to talk about. If you get to verse 18, he talks about little children. It is the last time you've heard that Antichrist shall come, right? Uh, even now there's many Antichrists. The Antichrists in the world go together. The system of the world comes from the Cain, line of Cain. And it is it develops into Antichrist. The beast is the final destination of the world. But we live in the world. Was Jesus in the of the world? Did he love the things of the world when he attended the party at Cana and provided the best wine? No. You know, this is something deeper. This is about your identity. But I will say that, I, that the reason the Antichrist can cause you to stumble in religion with their false doctrine is because you're afraid of them and you want their approval. And they can manipulate you with flattery. So there is an element here of growing. But again, the only way to come out of the world is to know Christ as your propitiation. It is not to say, I'm not going to love the world. I'm, I'm, grow, I'm, I'm abstaining from everything. That doesn't work. But Paul said, I'm crucified to the world and the world to me. My identity in it is done. I don't care. My reputation is done. It really comes down to embracing the fact that you're going to be persecuted and hated by the world. And taking that on as identity almost. Saying, you know what? I'm not greater than my master. Of course they're going to hate me. And it doesn't stumble you anymore when they do. You don't think that that means God's mad at you. Because you know you're not an orphan. You are in God's house and you are fixed in his presence because of the propitiation. It all comes down again to believing in Jesus' blood. Yes, I'm a sinner, but I'm safe in God's hands. And no, you can't make me feel like God doesn't love me because I don't live up to your carnal ordinances. You know, the, uh, the Pharisees were offended that Jesus and his disciples didn't wash their hands and didn't... Uh, do things the way they did according to their culture. Their culture was highly developed in the world and they had an identity about it. That's what he's talking about ultimately is where's your identity? And I'm telling you, if you are focused on Christ and your acceptance in God is based on Him, you are spontaneously being delivered from the world. But no, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to stop watching TV or not read books or not be entertained or not eat or not, you know, that's not what dying to the world is. It's something more intrinsic. Again, those people that at, were at that Reformed church and at the Chinese church I was in, you know, the Chinese church, the women wear her head coverings, they all wore black. Uh, they spent all their time together. They didn't watch TV. They, they, you know, that was their world. And they measured how much you were accepted by God by how well you were doing in that world. And that's really the root of the being in the world. You know, the religious world measures your relationship with God based on how well you do in the system. That's how you know you're loving the world is when you're accepting their value and evaluation of you. Hopefully this makes sense and helps people. I don't think this is intended to make us stumble. I think it's intended to show us again what the world is and he's going to talk about it in John 4 the world hates us and they don't recognize us as the sons of God because they've taken the way of Cain and it's not talking about the world in general it's talking about the religious world specifically Cain knew God required an offering Cain believed in God but he didn't believe in the person and work of Jesus
Jesus Christ. All right. 